Hello, I'm Marcus Brigstock and welcome to Breaking Good, the podcast rethinking separation and divorce brought to you by Forsters. Throughout the series, we're going to look at subjects that most of us think we know about, but in actual fact, we haven't got a clue. With blended families, same-sex families, cohabiting families, surrogacy, international couples, family law is changing all the time. And sometimes, very occasionally, the dear friend giving you divorce advice after consuming two and a half bottles of wine may not, and look, I could be wrong here, but I'm not, may not have the most up-to-date information, which is why we are here. In upcoming episodes, we'll be looking at no fault divorce, children and separation, court and how it can be avoided, and the thorny subject of prenups. But we're going to start with the basics and explore a few common misconceptions and a few new ideas as well. So first, let me introduce you to Joe Edwards. Hello, Joe. Hi, Marcus. I mean, this is exciting, isn't it? Because we're human beings in a room together. This is, it feels like the first time I've been out in forever and the first time that I've met um, Marcus and Sophie and I'm seeing Rosie again, not in 2D. So well, we should very say, exciting. we are also joined by Rosie Shum. Hello, Rosie. Hello, Marcus. Good to see you today. Uh, did you enjoy getting out of the house? I for did. For the first time, presumably, since February? It was, it was <laughs> actually quite nerve-wracking, but I've got over it and I'm now here and I'm happy. Good. Well, I'm happy to see you as well. What is the role of a family solicitor? I think people think they know, but how would you describe it? I think Rosie and I, we've probably got fairly similar ideas about this. I and mean, I think from my perspective, our role is actually quite wide ranging. And lots of the clients that I have, they become confidants, they become friends over time, and I'm often invited to their weddings. I had quite an awkward experience last year where I went to a wedding reception and I was sitting next to the lawyer with whom I'd negotiated the prenup um, for that client. Oh, so that, that, that was nice. Uh, that was very nice to, to actually make, make that acquaintance. And can you, are you allowed to talk about that when you sit down or do you both have to discreetly just acknowledge that that's a thing? I think on that particular occasion and because we were surrounded by others who didn't know our relationship, we acknowledged it was a thing, we had a glass of champagne we toasted the couple and we moved on and fortunately the prenup negotiations weren't weren't too contentious so we were able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so certainly that that is part of the role of a family lawyer. I mean, generally we think and we like to think of ourselves as being a peacemaker, a resolver, that might be something people think odd. But our mm. starting point with every case is always, can we try and sort this out for this couple? Because they've got shared histories together, mm. they've got children together in many instances, so we want to try and preserve relationships as parents. Mm. Sometimes we do have to be Rottweilers. I don't like to think of myself as a Rottweiler. I was trying to think, is there a cross between a Rottweiler and a Poodle? And apparently there is such a thing as a Rottedoodle. So perhaps no. I would think of myself as being a Rottedoodle in appropriate <laughs> cases. I think I met a Rotterdoodle in the park the other day, Did you? actually. Did you? And really... my Labradoodle got quite happy about that. Quite excited. <laughs> yeah. A really sort of ornamental, nice-looking dog that could turn at any moment. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> That's what you want. That's a good description, actually. But I think generally, Rosie, and I'm sure you'd agree, we have to be pretty calm dispassionate, um, detached in the work that we do because we see people in a heightened sense of emotion. Understandably, sometimes they're not making the most rational of decisions and we have to try and help them through that. I think definitely. I think the, the sense of dispassion, I would say actually, is about empathy um, combined with compassion, combined with level-headedness. I think we have to be very much the kind of pragmatist in very, very difficult situations. And our clients come to us engaged in a sort of personal trauma yeah. and we have to see them to the other side of it. So I think we have so many different guises, whether that's as sort of a litigator mm. or a negotiator or a conciliator. Joe's actually a trained mediator and can talk more about that. Yeah. But essentially we have to be the sort of voice of reason and to help them to get to the other side of a very, very difficult time in their lives. Tell me this then, do, do you because obviously you have all your all your legal training which is essential and when you start to specialize in family law is there more training is there help with that or do you just pick it up from working with each other in terms of empathy and helping people through a traumatic thing how do you get there that's one of the things that i would say has really changed during the course of my career so i started practicing 25 years ago in family law and at the time it was still fairly litigious but i think there is an increasing recognition and acceptance through organizations like resolution which promote a conciliatory approach that 
this is very different from a commercial litigation situation. These are people's lives. And so increasingly there is more therapeutic training. Rosie's mentioned I, I'm a trained mediator, for example, with that comes an mm. element of therapeutic training. A lot of it is picked up on the job. One of the benefits of working in the team we do is sharing our experience, pooling ideas. So so we also bounce ideas mm. off each other. But there's a big element of our job is is being part therapist, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Okay. My, my background is my dad was a social worker and my mum's a, a doctor. So I kind of grew up in this household where we were very, you know, very importantly socially committed and mm -hmm. I think as family lawyers we're not really in it to make lots of money we're in it to actually be very very um, helpful to people in really difficult situations if we wanted to make lots of money we'd have been commercial lawyers or corporate lawyers yeah. I think very much as family lawyers we have to be as Joe said part therapist I think one of my clients a few years ago said to me at the beginning of this process I was having such a difficult time I was really really troubled I didn't know where I was going and you helped to empower me to get to the other side of this and I think that's that's our greatest skill I think as family lawyers that we're able to help people through really difficult experiences and help yeah. them so that the other side of it can they can see much more clearly wh wh why they decided something at that particular moment in time and why their life is in a much better place now yeah. and we can hopefully help them to achieve happiness and some money in the process mm. to make sure they're secure in the world beyond. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk much more about this, I think, as the series goes on. But it's an interesting thing, legally speaking, isn't it? That, like, what is a win where this mm. is concerned? It's it's not as it's not as straightforward as one person in a separation or divorce wins and the other loses. Both have to win, sort of, to some extent. Mm. There's some middle ground there. But as I say, we'll talk about more about that as we go on what then are the the big misconceptions about family solicitors i think joe's already touched upon one of them and that's that we're all kind of rottweilers and we like the theater of it all it's a bit uh, cinematic in yeah. its approach that it's you know what's that scarlett johansson film that was out last year but that kind of thing marriage story marriage story yeah. or kramer versus kramer yeah and you know it's that kind of thing it's not like that really i mean of course there's a little bit of drama but we're trying to to sort of diffuse that to take yeah. out the sort of emotional language and to try to finesse it with a sort of strategy and a way forward for for our clients yeah. Yeah, and Rosie's absolutely right that there is this common misconception that it's all about Kramer versus Kramer, big court battles, that the family lawyers are there trying to encourage people to go to court. I mean, only last week I was talking to one of my clients who was due to be going to a final hearing fairly soon, and I really had to twist his arm to persuade him, actually, it's going to be better for you just to settle this case now on terms that are broadly acceptable to both of you. So it's absolutely right to say it's not about a win. And I always mm. say to clients that if I either of you feel you've had a big win then we've got the outcome wrong it needs to be fair to the family that's interesting so here's here's something that i think is a conception i'd be interested to know whether you think it's a misconception that if you are getting divorced uh this is slow it's slow it takes ages and everything uh i'm talking very much from my own experience here uh a lot of paperwork uh a lot of uh, exchanging emails and messages and meetings, each one of which you're you're counting the cost. It, it, does it go as quickly as as it should? And I, I've actually heard divorce described quite recently as either quick torture or slow torture. Yeah. I'm not sure I'd necessarily agree with that. Um, and what we are trying to do is to encourage people when they come to see us to take control of their process. You know, there are all sorts of different options. It doesn't have to be what people might think is the norm of what you've described, solicitors, letters flying back and forth, phone calls, it all taking a long time. Mm. So a lot of clients come to us at a point where actually they broadly know what they want the outcome to be and we can help them implement that. Sometimes they need a bit of help so they might come to a mediation with me or go to another mm. mediator to try and work that through. So I think one of the huge changes there has been during the course of my career is that there are many more options available to clients now and mm. people going through a separation or divorce so that they determine the sort of separation or divorce they're going to have not the lawyers mm. uh, just so i'm i'm clear on it when you're when you're mediating mm. 
that's obviously not i'm saying obviously that's in a situation where you're not representing one or other of those people right that's a separate like that's, a separate that's job that's exactly right so it's a separate part of my practice where sometimes i'll be referred a couple who they may be in court proceedings there may be no court proceedings but there's goodwill there they know that the best way forward will be if they are the authors of their own settlement mm. and so they come into a process with me it might be about money issues it might be about children it might be about both sometimes it's actually about how they might save their marriage and sometimes mm. the, the concern is perhaps there isn't financial transparency. So we talk about that. And the, the end of that process might be a transfer of assets or at least some disclosure, a post-nuptial agreement. So that actually they, they carry on with their marriage. But fundamentally, I'm a neutral facilitator yeah. in that process. I'm sure it wouldn't be right for every couple, uh, or, uh, needless to say, lots wouldn't have children. But when I uh, got divorced... Our mediator, I think from our second mediation session, it, uh, encouraged us to have photographs of our children on the table in front of us mm -hmm. while we talked. I mean, not placed there, like right in front of us, but on the table. She said, oh, it'd be good to have pictures of the kids and just put them on the table. And I, I have to say, at the time, as painful as that was, God, that was smart. Mm -hmm. It was such a clever thing to do because it really was a, a stark reminder like why are you in this room what what are you trying to achieve here and it was the best possible outcome for these two people who've had no say mm -hmm. at all in you getting married having them and now separating it was it was brilliant is that have you have you done that I, is that part I, of sort of basic I, training I, I have done that it's not necessarily part of the basic training yeah. it will depend on the couple in question but if i feel as though they're not being children focused and they're really rooted in their conflict it is a really good way forward. The other thing we, we can and do do on occasion is actually involve the children directly in the process mm. if they want to have their voices heard. So that's not right for every case. Sure. It's generally only right for children aged 10 and above. Mm. But I've got a case at the moment where the parents are just asking us to bring the children into the process. So that, that's exactly mm. what we're doing. Breaking good. Rethinking separation and divorce. Brought to you by Forsters. If you don't mind me asking both of you, how long have you practised family law? Oh, I've been in it since about 2004 and I trained at a legal aid firm in Norwich and then okay. moved to London to specialise in, in sort of high net worth divorces. Yeah. And that was quite a... <laughs> That was so that's your specialism, fire. Rosie, in, in <laughs> high net worth divorces. Yeah, high right. net worth divorces, prenuptial agreements. Yes. But my background is actually children legal aid. So I started okay. at a firm in, in Norwich in 2004 mm. and then came to came to London soon thereafter. And I had my kids really young because I was in 2006. Mm. So like a typical Geordie lass. Yeah. Geordie lass having me kids. You just went for it straight away. Went for it straight away. There was I've, no I've come out of no college. Back. Ganoot, pop and moot, pop and moot. <laughs> Don't put that on. <laughs> Don't worry. That's so going out. We're going to open with that. Pot moot. Pot moot. That's it. <laughs> uh, Joe, how about you? How long have you practised family I law? I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I've practiced family law. 2021 will be my 25th year somehow of practicing okay. family law. Uh, probably quite a traditional background. I have to say I came to the law because I, I was a child who I loved LA law in the 1980s. And then I loved Ali McBeal in the 1990s. And it all looked very glamorous. Yeah. Um, so yeah, went went into family law, started in the mid 1990s. So Joe, uh, to, uh, about 25 years in family law, and I think 16 years, roughly yeah. thereabouts. What's changed since you started in family law? I think quite a lot has changed. I mean, one of the things that really strikes me is the change in pace and how everything feels like it's much more fast moving. Now, I'm ashamed to admit I'm so old that when I started practicing, I didn't even have an email account. And it was quite racy if we got a fax arrive. Yeah, And that felt, exciting. you know, quite, quite, things were moving on quite quickly. But, you know, letters would take days and days. Court orders would take days and days. Um, when I was doing research, I had to actually physically go to the Law Society Library on Chancery Lane, get books out and, you know, do that research. I think it's both a blessing and a curse, the pace at which things move these days. I think sometimes it encourages clients. They want instant knee-jerk 
reactions or they, they may do um, and that's not always the right way forward yeah. just to shoot an email out so I think pace is is quite a significant thing um, I do think that as we've alluded to already court is regarded less and less as being the norm in family mm. proceedings and that's really positive from my perspective so my mediation practice I've had now for about 10 years but it's really taken off more and more in the past five years and government's very very keen to push more and more couples into mediation mm. finally that seems to be taking hold but I think there's still a long way to go we do still see quite significant numbers of cases in the family courts but hopefully that will begin uh, to change as well when you say significant numbers I mean look I'm aware attaching specific numbers to these things is sometimes unhelpful because things change and change and all the rest of it but if you're willing if you had to put a percentage of like how many divorces in the UK end up in court do you know I, putting it slightly differently so looking specifically at uh, finances on divorce yeah. and how many of those cases might go to trial what i typically say to my clients is fewer than fewer than 2% of those cases will end up in a fully contested final hearing so mm. when we see stats and rosie knows i'm a huge fan of stats and i do study the stats quite closely mm. um you see a lot of applications but actually most of those cases along the way, even though they start in court, they will settle. And that's one of yeah. the other things that's changed actually during the course of my practice, going back to an earlier question, is there's a lot more focus on conciliation, on trying to get couples to agreement. Mm. And so both in money and children cases, it's now part of the process that you have a hearing where the judge will roll his or her sleeves up and will actually actively try to settle the case. So I've got one of those hearings later this week where the whole focus is let's try and avoid that, that fully contested final hearing. So that actually is is quite unusual. I normally say I average one final hearing about every three years. I feel like I've slipped okay. up. I've had a couple in the last year. That's mm. exceptionally high for me. Yeah. So I think the way that it's changed for me really is the way that we work. If I think about starting in 2004 in this sort of faceless corporate environment, working between 8 and 8am 8 and 10pm, I think the idea of sort of agile and flexible working and, the, and balancing home life with work life is vastly improved. And I think it's much better for working families, um, be they fathers or mothers. Mm. We can balance it, balance it a lot better than we used to. Um, I say that because I was a mum in 2006, and so my kids were very young at the very start of my career, which is probably the hardest time to have kids. Mm. And so I fought through quite a lot of very late nights and difficult times, um, and it was pretty difficult at the time. I think Joe remembers me from that time and how hard it was. And I think in a quite a bad way, I probably disguised my motherhood and pretended I didn't have kids to quite a lot of people as a way of just getting through it. But now I hope that I'm a role model for other working mums in that I don't do that. I, Joe and I both promote that idea of flexible working and the idea of modern families. I mean, it is difficult to have it all, but yeah. I think family mm. law is definitely much better catered for in terms of the work-life balance. And I think particularly in COVID, it's much easier to have that balance. And I think that's a huge benefit from the current environment that we're working in, albeit it's really tough. Yeah. It is It is much better for work-life balance. But yeah, that's an interesting, uh, a whole other podcast, actually. Do you think that the, 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 the pandemic, lockdowns and doing more and more work online, I mean, obviously it's changed things for you, but do you think that that will mark a change going forward from here? I, mean, I, I think it really will. and it's A positive change? A, a positive change, yes. I think it's opened people's eyes. I mean, I have to say I, I was probably still am to a degree quite a dinosaur when it comes to remote working, online court hearings. Have you got an email address now? I now have an email address. Oh, that's good, which, which is a good start, yes. Yeah, well and I, I, I've had to get to grips with technology this year, but I yeah. think I've managed it. My associates in the team might disagree. Um, <laughs> so, so, but I think that... I think it. Trying to look for the, the positives coming out of this year. The family court, like so many things, the family court had to come up to speed really quickly. So we had about uh, three weeks a month in March, April, where hearings had to be taken out of the diary. We weren't yeah. set up for them at all. But very quickly, remote systems were put in place. Um, I'm still slightly sceptical as to whether it's the right way of working for all cases and for all types of, of client. There have been a couple of um, research uh, reports published during the course of the pandemic. And the 
snapshot of those seems to be lawyers love this way of working. Um, I think those who are going through the divorce and separation themselves less so generally. Mm. And of course, I'm talking about the cases, to be fair, where people have the benefit of representation. Now, 81% of cases in the family court, at least one person has no representation at all. So I can't even begin to imagine how difficult that is for somebody who's doing it themselves, trying to muddle through a hearing yeah. um, and not really fully understanding what's going on around them. And what's what's your understanding of why somebody would do this particular thing without representation? Because it's, you know, having been through it, I was very mindful of what it mm. cost and that was terrifying. But the idea of trying to do it without help it spins my head. Why Why would people make that choice? Is it a money thing? Well, it's through necessity, and it is a money thing. And I think it yeah. is very, you know, solicitors are expensive commodities. But also knowing they have to make an application to the court, they have to perhaps see their child because they haven't seen them for several months mm. and so their only option in that situation is to make an application for, for child arrangements to see their child. I think I, I've been at a few hearings where there have been litigants in person on the other side and judges have actually been incredibly sensitive to that and we talk about us being part therapists I'm always absolutely in awe of judges who are able to actually deal with that situation where someone is representing themselves to make sure that they've had a fair hearing mm. and I have some really good examples of that in the last few months that I've I've seen um, I've Joe and I have both undertaken at Forsters even though we deal with high net, ultra high net worth clients and high net worth clients we also do a bit of pro bono work and I've been doing a little bit of um, domestic violence um, protection, shall we say, with clients who are in very vulnerable situations, as has Joe in Brighton. Mm. And I've been working in conjunction with Solace to try and help women out of really difficult situations. And that's why I think it's really good as family lawyers that we stay connected to people at, at, at different ends of the spectrum. So yeah. that we I think it makes us better lawyers, actually. Mm. And I know Joe and I, it's something we both feel quite passionate about, that even though we're helping you know, wealthy clients on a daily basis that we still can give something back. Yeah, absolutely. What, what I would also want to make clear to listeners is the fact that there really is no substitute, I think, for at least some initial tailored legal advice. So what we have lost, I have to say, as a result of the legal aid cuts now six, seven years ago, is having that advice available to everybody. And although I totally appreciate that not everybody has the budget to have a Rolls-Royce service of representation at every turn, and I, I do fully understand that, it, it's a very complicated system at the moment. I know there are there's the desire to change it but there's quite broad discretion as to what judges can do both mm. in money cases and children cases and just investing in some initial advice at least hopefully signpost people in the right direction mm. I do hope to see a lot more of that online I think there will be I know the government are very keen to put a lot more information online and to try and demystify the whole divorce and separation process for mm. individuals who do have to represent themselves but I, I say again, I think just taking some advice so you're put in the right direction and you're not just pursuing a hopeless case potentially for a year or two through the family court and having that time taken out of your life, it's really important that you just think about that investment. Breaking good. Rethinking separation and divorce. Brought to you by Forsters. Outside of your own working practices, how have people's expectations of family law shifted in the time that you've been practicing? You know, when people arrived 25 years mm. ago, 16 years ago, saying, unfortunately, we have to get a divorce, what did they come with then and what do they come with now? I think one of the big differences I have noticed is that people tend to be um, better informed, more savvy um, when they first come to see me, whether that's because they've spoken to friends who've gone through a divorce or separation or because there is already a plethora of information out there. They come in and they are more well versed in things like mediation and may be proactively asking and seeking out my assistance for mediation, um, knowing about the possibility of their children being involved in the process, having their voices heard. So I think that, that that has been a significant shift for me. There's still some way to go, but I think generally people, they do, it does feel like people are better informed. I assume sometimes that's unhelpful, people arriving with the stuff mm. they've read. It can't always be like... It, I mean, I think one of the most difficult 
challenges for us is when people compare divorce notes with their best friend because of course there is so much discretion as to what the financial outcome will be in England and Wales and no two cases are alike and you really can't draw parallels from what your friend down the road got so that that can be quite challenging mm. saying well I don't know the full facts of that case but I'm sure there's very good reason why um she's getting more than I'm advising you may get, for example. Mm, I think there are a lot of pseudo lawyers out there. And I think just, you know, if you are going to involve your friend in it, don't take everything that your friend says to you as gospel as the way forward. I think just be circumspect and be objective about it, really. Mm. And the other thing that I would say has uh, sort of changed, if you like, in clients' expectations and what and what they're coming to the table with now compared to when I started, it's probably actually... Um, more emphasis on on sharing care with the kids there's much more emphasis on on this sort of gone are the days of the homemaker and the financial provider and that kind of dichotomy between those two roles I think much more now it's much more emphasis on being able to work together as parents so I think they're actually more child-centric than they once were I don't know if you agree with me on that, Joe. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And people constantly come in with the children issues and ask us what, what the norms actually are. But because the way in which people parent during relationships has changed quite significantly, mm. even during the course of, of my practising, um, they tend to come in from that background of they, they genuinely have shared care. Mm. And that is the right outcome for the children moving forward. I, mean, I was going to say one of the other things that I think we've both noticed is an increase in unmarried couple work and that that's unsurprising because if you look at the trends the marriage rate is going down cohabiting couples are the fastest growing family type mm. every time the ONS publishes stats and there I am back to the stats again um, the number has grown exponentially and that creates huge challenges for us as family lawyers because they're really not well provided for in England and Wales under the law so we have to try and be quite creative when those types of couple come in and sometimes we have to say unfortunately that the law won't protect you at all and that that can be a very hard piece is, of advice to give is that the case joe if if a, if a couple are cohabiting there just isn't the protection under the law for them so at the moment the protection there is is very patchwork and it's based on a combination of property law trusts law so it will be dependent either upon somebody having made a direct financial contribution to the purchase price of a property which invariably they don't both do only one of them will purchase um, or on one of them reassuring the other one that they would provide for them if ever the relationship breaks down. Well, frankly, who keeps evidence of that when you're in a happy relationship? Not the sort of evidence that lawyers would need. So what we're typically saying to unmarried couples is unless there is one of those factors present or indeed if there are minor children and um, where, where there are minor children there'll be limited provision for housing but that's very much typically a house being purchased but it's loaned to the, the primary carer typically mm. the mum not always the mum but it, it then will revert to dad when the children grow up and there'll be child maintenance but that effectively will be it so that other parent doesn't have claims in her own right I say her mm. isn't always the case and that's something which I've been very, very keen to see the law change. It's something that the Law Commission, our law reform body in England and Wales, looked at 13 years ago. But to, there's no to, Specifically to provide better protection under the law for cohabiting couples, exactly. particularly where, where, presumably with kids. Exactly so, where they separate or where the relationship ends through death, because the provisions on death are very different as well. Mm. So across the piece, the Law Commission 13 years ago recommended change. There's not been the political appetite um, for that. I shouldn't be greedy because what we did get was no-fault divorce this year. We've campaigned for that for about 40 years. We'll be talking about that on the next podcast. Yeah. But cohabitation reform really I think for both of us is the next big area we would like to see Definitely. change. Because in Scotland, if you've been if you've been living together as a cohabiting couple, I think it's for a year, isn't it, Joe? And you suffered economic disadvantage, then I think you can have a sort of financial claim against the other, albeit limited. Yeah. And it's the same in Australia. I think after two years, so it does seem that we're behind the times, and I think it is the next thing on the on the agenda that we're going to be pushing for. Yeah. Well, we will talk more about this as the series goes on. So looking at the future. Um, are there such things as trends in family law? 
Yes, I, th I think there are quite a few trends in family law that, that we are seeing. So I've mentioned the existence and the growth of more creative alternatives to court, more blending of options so that people have the, the right processes available to them, um, more self-help being uh, available to people, um, only involving family lawyers, perhaps with the detailed advice where they need that specialised um, input. A lot of processes are going to become more accessible online, so we've seen that most hand with, with the divorce process itself and the last couple of years that has moved online believe it or not solicitors are still filing paper processes but for those representing themselves that that is accessible there was some mm. statistic i think that last christmas day 12 people issued online divorce petitions across the country so that that was something that seemed to get latched onto in the media but that accessibility of process to people I think will be a trend. Um, I've mentioned already I think we are going to see increasing numbers of unmarried couples coming in to see us um, and I hope that, that things change so that we can assist them. Um, definitely more modern families and different uh, family type units who we're working with so I, I looked at the um, new the most recent divorce statistics which came out last week the divorce numbers had gone up quite significantly but one of the points that was latched on um, I noticed in the media was the fact that there was a huge growth in same-sex couples getting divorced and specifically 72% of those being um, female couples who were getting divorced so a bit of a trend there and then I think finally for me more complicated and involved parenting arrangements such as surrogacy which is certainly a trend for us which again at the moment the law really hasn't caught up with that area and judges have had to be quite innovative in certain cases to try and provide uh, for people so I think quite quite a few things for me that I mm. think are changing and will continue to evolve but Rosie I'm sure you've spotted a lot more <laughs> well just a few more actually I think I would just add to that remote hearings are becoming the norm mm -hmm. and I think that's certainly on the advent of COVID has meant that we've had to think about doing things in a new way. It was a real catalyst for us changing the way we work for the better I think. So bigger contested hearings will still be in person but those remote hearings um, for more housekeeping matters can take place and it means the courts will be less congested mm -hmm. meaning there will be more judges time freed up etc. So there's a real there are real benefits to that I think in the long term. The other thing I think that might uh, that is a real trend at the moment is the move away from sort of ongoing maintenance for dependent wives or ex-wives. And I think that's something that's been reflected in the prevalence of sort of dual income families. There's an increasing emphasis by leading judges for maintenance orders, sort of meal tickets for life is the colloquial way that it's been coined, but essentially ending that, meaning that actually there'll be probably be more clean break orders. And we're certainly seeing an increase in clients coming to us where they've got ongoing maintenance obligations to an ex-wife. And they're saying to us, actually, in this environment, she's, she's earning still. Why should I be paying her at that level and conversely we also act on the other side for wives who are saying well actually my ex-husband is actually still earning um, and I shouldn't I shouldn't be cut off to such a great extent so that's mm. another another trend and I guess just to chip in there Rosie as you've alluded to there quite often increasingly often the payers of spousal maintenance are the, the wives not not the husbands so I think that is quite a change and it's not automatically the assumption that it's the wives who will be the recipients of, of spousal maintenance Okay, so that yeah, so that stuff has shifted. I mean, a lot, a lot of stuff is is changing. Then, I mean, I, I, just picking up on uh, same sex couples divorcing. I mean, I suppose it's not hugely surprising that round about now, given that it hasn't been all that long since they've been allowed to get married, that that their divorce figures would fall roughly in line with everyone else's. I, I think that's fair comment. I mean, it's been five years now. Well, between we had the obviously first same-sex marriages in 2014. These were the divorce numbers for 2019. Yeah. So yes, it's it's not that surprising that those numbers are beginning to come through. Um, the average length of a marriage is about 11.4 years, something like that. So interesting to see how that moves on in the future as well. Mm. Breaking good. Rethinking separation and divorce. Brought to you by Forsters. The way that people co-parent after a divorce, I mean, my, my own situation was that uh, I said to my now ex-wife, it's not going to do us any good arranging that you have the children then and I have them then. We didn't live like that when we were married, so why on earth would we fall into these formal uh, ways of living when we're divorced? It will have to be a thing where we arrange... Um, who has the children when 
on an ongoing basis because our working lives are, are like that. Do you see more couples like that or am I unusual? I'd like to think I'm unique. <laughs> I think we do see more couples like that. I mean, it, ev every case is very different when it comes to the children. We see some quite innovative arrangements. Some people do the, the, the birds nesting that you hear about in the, in the media where they effectively have the children will stay in a property, particularly where they're still sorting everything out. So mm. children will stay in one property and it's the parents who will come and go. Um, and then lots more sharing of care. And I think it's fair to say there is also a lot more complexity in some of the children work we do particularly because increasingly with social mobility we work with a lot of international couples so in the more difficult cases you've got somebody who might want to move home to Australia mm. or to New Zealand or to Canada after a divorce and then that quandary of what do we actually do about the children also and I've certainly seen this as a trend this year with the advent of Covid more people wanting to move out of the cities to the countryside and take the children and where they're separated and the other parent wants to stay put but obviously that, that's creating difficulties. And I've had a few discussions with clients recently who I might have done their divorce a few years ago, but suddenly that's an issue that's having to be grappled with. Mm. So that, that can be hugely challenging, particularly where you've got parents who have shared the care and then suddenly there's going to be a two, three, four hour drive between homes, which means almost ripping up the parenting agreement and starting again. Mm. So I think we see the whole gamut really, Rosie, don't we? Yeah, we definitely do. I think what you were saying really is about autonomy, isn't it? It's about you deciding together and sort of in some ways taking it into your own hands. But I think it really does depend on the ages of the children to the extent to which um, contact arrangements perhaps in your situation work better because you could be more fluid about it because the children are a bit older. But I think when children are much younger, I think um, having a sort of clear clear timeline of when you see the children and um, when one party sees the children when the other sees the children can be quite useful and can be quite a good formula to follow mm. but I think really it's about autonomy it's about you sort of you know I'm, that's another trend that I'm seeing is that couples are a lot more autonomous than they've been before they're reading a lot more they're working out from a sort of pseudo therapeutic perspective that something is good for their children and they'll sort of follow that through. Mm, mm. And what about the the shifts into doing things online? I mean, obviously, COVID's meant that you're doing that more and more. Do you think more divorces will be done online in the future? I think in terms of the divorce process itself and taking the process through to decree, absolute, undoubtedly so. That, that's mm. a no-brainer and that is very much the intended direction of travel. Um, and I think over the next couple of years that will be universally the case. So far as sorting out arrangements for um, children and the finances are concerned, I mean, when I mediate, I've actually quite enjoyed doing that by Zoom this year, but I think there's no substitute for getting everybody together. I think the court hearings um, still very much up for grabs, up for discussion. And I think with those contested cases, the few cases that do need to be decided, there is no substitute, I think, for the couple almost having their day in court, um, letting them give their, their evidence live and hopefully fully understand the process going on around them and the, the decisions that are being made. So mm. I think we'll have to have a lot of discussion um, once we are touching wood through this pandemic and a, think about what's going to work best for, for those actually engaging in the process. Mm. On a really depressing note, I think sometimes you need a funeral to get over a death. I think in the same way, sometimes you need a court hearing to get over a divorce. And I think sometimes I, we talked about the theatre of it all, although we don't encourage that as family lawyers. I think certainly sometimes clients want that forum to actually get their message across, to get their case across. And so I sometimes think that replacing hearings completely remotely is not the way forward and as mm. long as our clients are debating child arrangements debating um, the value of assets perhaps their property in Kensington or their business in Dubai um, well, there will always be a place for family lawyers if your next question is going to be are we going to be replaced by robots I don't <laughs> well think come on self-driving <laughs> cars and all of that <laughs> I don't think that's the case I think certainly as the law stands, it will be jolly difficult. I hope, frankly, I'm never replaced by AI. But I keep talking about the broad discretion that the court has. And it's not just a case of putting, gosh, I think we all hate the thought of algorithms after what's gone on this year. But, you know, you can't just put some numbers into a machine and expect it to compute the result in family law. It doesn't quite work like that. It's about the individual couple and what's right for their family. Mm. Although in Switzerland, they're very, very empirical about these things and they have tables to work out exactly what someone's going to get on a divorce, which I thought was quite fascinating. Oh, do they? 
OK, but will London, I mean, London, we're right here in the heart of the capital and and London is the divorce capital of the world, which is nice. Uh, <laughs> will that will that remain the case? And more people are moving away anyway. Well, yeah. I think it will. I think we remain an international hub despite Brexit and despite Covid. We remain somewhere that people want to school their kids. We've got a really good school mm -hmm. system. We've got great university system. We've got great culture. When the West End's back open and again, it will mm. be wonderful. Um, so I think it's still going to attract these sort of international peripatetic families who want to have these sort of um, excellent um, existence in the children's minor years. Mm. And I think that I think that's going to stay. And I think as long as there are international families coming into this country, I think we will remain the divorce capital of the world. Mm. Woohoo! Um, uh, on a, I mean, we need to, we need to finish really, but just quickly. I mean, far fewer people have got married, I presume, since the lockdown started and all the rest of it. And you both spend a reasonable amount mm. of time arranging prenuptials. Mm. Uh, are you all right? <laughs> work? I, are you OK? I, you busy I, I, I think Covid has thrown up quite a few and um, quite enough issues this year, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, it has been an interesting year because um, we have continued to have an inflow of prenups, mm. uh, perhaps not quite as many as usual. I think towards the back end of the year, maybe mm. weddings that were postponed early on they've now started to, to take place and people are deciding to have the smaller civil ceremonies with mm. a big party at some point in, hopefully in 21, if not in 2022. Um, generally, as I've mentioned, in any event, the marriage rate has been going down. But I think in terms of this year specifically, we'll see those marriage numbers pop back up again yeah. next year. Hopefully people will, will get to have the ceremonies they want. I mean, we were very happy one of the associates in our team got married this year in September. Mm. So uh, she's not been put off by the job. Um, no, good. <laughs> but, 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 but hopefully next year people will be able to have the sort of ceremonies that they want and we will very much be encouraging them to have prenups and that's a topic that we will also be revisiting. Yes, we will, we will. I think there will definitely be a flurry of prenups, certainly after Christmas mm. and I've certainly seen a flurry in the last few months. I think that as long as our hearts are beating and as long as we're continuing to love, we'll continue to wed. That is absolutely true. I really wanted to take some uh, questions online, but there's literally only been one from a uh, Melania Trump, and we haven't got time to get into <laughs> what she sent us. So that is all the time we've got That's for hilarious. today. Uh, I've been Marcus Brigstock. Thank you very much to Joe Edwards and Rosie Shum, and of course to our producer, Sophie Black. Uh, next time we'll be discussing no-fault divorce and whether it will really make divorce a kinder, more civilised process. If you have any questions or thoughts, do please tweet us at, at Forster's Family, and we'll try and answer your questions. Until then, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.